Chapter 43 My friend Boggs The school report Boggs pays me an old debt Virginia City However, as I grew better acquainted with the business and I learned the run of the sources of information, I ceased to require the aid of fancy to any large extent, and I became able to fill my columns without diverging noticeably from the domain of fact. I struck up friendships with the reporters of the other journals, and we swapped regulars with each other and thus economized work. Regulars are permanent sources of news, like courts, bullion returns, cleanups at the courts' mills, and inquests. Inasmuch as everybody went armed, we had an inquest about every day, and so this department was naturally set down among the regulars. We had lively papers in those days. My great competitor among the reporters was Boggs of the Union. He was an excellent reporter. Once in three or four months, he would get a little intoxicated, but as a general thing, he was a wary and cautious drinker, although always ready to tamper a little with the enemy. He had the advantage of me in one thing. He could get the monthly public school report, and I could not, because the principal, hatred, because the principal hated the enterprise. One snowy night when the report was due, I started out sadly, wondering how I was going to get it. Presently, a few steps up the almost deserted street, I stumbled on Boggs and asked him where he was going. After the school report, I'll go along with you. No, sir, I'll excuse you, just as you say. A saloon keeper's boy passed by with a steaming pitcher of hot punch, and Boggs snuffed the fragrance gratefully. He gazed fondly after the boy and saw him start up the Enterprise stairs. I said, I wish you could help me get the, that school business, but since you can't, I must run up to the union office and see if I can get them to let me have a proof of it after they have set it up, though I don't begin to sp suppose they will. Good night. Hold on a minute. I don't mind getting the report and sitting around with the boys a little while you copy it if you're willing to drop down to the principles with me. Now you talk like a rational being. Come along. We plowed a couple of blocks through the snow, got the report, and returned to our office. It was a short document and soon copied. Meantime, Boggs helped himself to the punch. I gave the manuscript back to him, and we started out to get an inquest, for we heard pistol shots nearby. We got the particulars with little loss of time, for it was only an inferior sort of barroom murder and of little interest to the public. And then we separated. Any, away, at, away at three o'clock in the morning, when we had gone to press and were having a relaxing concert as usual, for some of the printers were good singers and others per good performers on the guitar and on that atrocity, the accordion. The proprietor of the union strode in and desired to know if anybody had heard anything of Boggs or the school report. We started the case and all turned out to help hunt for the delinquent. We found him standing on a table in a saloon with an old tin lantern in one hand and the school report in the other, haranguing a gang of intoxicated Cornish miners on the inequity of squandering the public monies on education when hundreds and hundreds this is a quote, of honest, hard-working men are literally starving for whiskey. End of quote. Riotous applause. He had been assisting in a regal spree with those parties for hours. We dragged him away and put him to bed. Of course, there was no school report in the Union, and Boggs held me accountable though I was innocent of any intention or desire to compass its absence from that paper, and was as sorry as anyone that the misfortune had occurred. But we were perfectly friendly. The day that the school report was next due, the proprietor of the Genesee mine furnished us a buggy and asked us to go down and write something about the property. A very common request, and one always gladly accepted to when people furnished buggies 
for we were as fond of pleasure excursions as other people. In due time we arrived at the mine. Quotes, nothing but a hole in the ground, ninety feet deep, and no way of getting down into it but by holding on to a rope and being lowered with a windlass. The workmen had just gone off somewhere to dinner. I was not strong enough to lower Boggs's bulk, so I took an unlighted candle in my teeth, made a loop for my foot in the end of the rope, implored Boggs not to go to sleep or let the windlass get the start of me, and then swung out over the shaft. I reached the bottom, muddy and bruised about the elbows, but safe. I lit the candle, made an examination of the rock, selected some specimens, and shouted to Boggs to hoist away. No answer. Presently a head appeared in the circle of daylight, away aloft, and a voice came down. Are you all set? All set. Hoist away. Are you comfortable? Perfectly. Could you wait a little? Oh, certainly. No particular hurry. Well, goodbye. Why? Where are you going? After the school report. And he did. I stayed down there an hour and surprised the workmen when they hauled up and found a man on the rope instead of a bucket of rock. I walked home, two, five miles uphill. We had no school report next morning, but the Union had. Six months after my entry into journalism, the grand flush times of Silverland began, and they continued with unabated splendor for three years. All difficulty about filling up the local department ceased, and the only trouble now was how to make the lengthened columns hold the world of incidents and happenings that came to our literary net every day. Virginia had grown to be the liveliest town for its age and population that America had ever produced. The sidewalks swarmed with people, to such an extent, indeed, that it was generally no easy matter to stem the human tide. The streets themselves were just as crowded with quartz wagons, freight teams, and other vehicles. The procession was endless, so great was the pack that buggies frequently had to wait half an hour for an opportunity to cross the principal street. Joy sat on every countenance, and there was a glad, almost fierce intensity in every eye that told of the money-getting schemes that were seething in every brain, and the high hope that held sway in every heart. Money was as plenty as dust. Every individual considered himself wealthy, and a melancholy countenance was nowhere to be seen. There were military companies, fire companies, brass bands, banks, hotels, theaters, hurdy-gurdy houses, wide-open gambling palaces, political powwows, civic processions, street fights, murders, inquests, riots, a whiskey mill every fifteen steps, a board of aldermen, a mayor, a city surveyor, a city engineer, a chief of the fire department with first, second, and third assistants, a chief of police, city marshal, and a large police force, two boards of mining brokers, a dozen breweries and half a dozen jails and station houses, in full operation, and some talk of building a church. The flush times were in magnificent flower. Large fireproof brick buildings were going up in the principal streets, and the wooden suburbs were spreading out in all directions. Town lots soared up to prices that were amazing. The great Comstock load stretched its opulent length straight through the town from north to south, and every mine